chug, 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 Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Wizard Staff Podcast. I am your host, Blake. And I'm Guy. And we are two drunk novices who like to talk about EDH. We do drink and swear, so you've been warned. Please drink responsibly when playing children's games. Tonight, we are revisited by a very special guest. You know him, you love him. Our friend Park. Park, say hello. I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> special Weschel. Yes. Oh boy, oh howdy. Uh, yeah, so you may remember Park from our Stacks episode, our How to Write a Primer episode, and the Hearthstone episode versus magic which will never air in the light of day oh god no i was way too drunk i didn't write any notes about it and i talked for like two hours incoherently it's dead it's gone <laughs> i mean i still have it on my hard drive i just don't want to look at it don't ever look at it it also aged poorly we recorded at a time that was immediately massive amount of changes so like 80 percent of what i said was outdated uh, oh, you love to see it, you know? Just so much hard work. <laughs> oh, hell gone. Yeah. It's good stuff. <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah, but tonight we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. Tonight, we I don't really see many other people talk about it too much on other EDH podcasts. We're going to be talking about grinder decks and what that means and control magic in the commander format. Just control decks in general. Yeah. 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 And but before yeah. before we do any of that though, we gotta talk about what we're drinking, guys. Guy, what are you drinking? Oh well, I'm drinking the Emperor, which is the true taste of the distilled liqueur. Uh, it is a 24% proof soju, and I picked it up from my local HK Mart, and it's made from rice and sweet potatoes. Uh, I will say that it is pretty smooth going down. Um, I've taken a few shots, and it doesn't have that kind of hot, burning sensation that most liquors have when you have shots. It, it, it goes down pretty nice. Like, I mean, it's it's liquor, so it's not like it tastes great, but like, it, it, it doesn't make me want to vomit. I beg to differ, man. I love alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you actually made a cocktail, didn't you? I always make cocktails. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I made a nice little berry fizz using a little bit of uh, some quality dry gin with cranberry and a little bit of a well, something something, a little bit of sweet and sour, and then you top it off with a nice bit of ginger ale. And then I was like, you know what? That's not enough alcohol. So I made a fatty margarita with a little bit of uh, pardita tequila, some Grand Marnier, and a little bit of uh, sweet and sour. You add extra... Oh, good. It's already a mess. I already can't remember. A bit more orange liquor. And it's just a nice little <laughs> mix of uh, strong alcohol and juice. It's a good time for everybody. Let me tell you. I find it funny that, like, you know, Guy and I do this podcast where, like, we drink every episode. But you're the one who, like, actually has, like, a mini bar and, and makes drinks. Hell yeah, you know it. That's why you need me, so I can actually add some class in this production. <laughs> Uh, what are you talking about? We're gonna be lowbrow forever. He uh, actually knows yeah. this stuff. <laughs> That's why you need me to just keep coming back, and I will, whether you want me to or not. You know what? Some episodes will be incomprehensible, but that's the joy of it. Yeah, that's half the fun. All right, and to round it off, I am drinking Hibiki Suntory whiskey. It's uh, from Japan, and it's this really nice whiskey that's actually worth money. And I'm of course drinking it on the rocks because if you mix this this is actually good like why would you mix this with anything yeah i can vouch for it uh hibiki is good good stuff not sponsored by the way yeah oh i wish oh oh god i wish yeah if we could, if we could get sponsored by stuff that would be like the pride and joy like i'm like all right we made it one day accomplished one day. yeah all right so we can move forward and start talking about the actual topic of this episode. How about it? So, Park, do you want to spend just a little bit of time just talking about control decks? And what does it mean to you for a deck to be a control deck in Commander? Give us the Webster's Dictionary version <laughs> of, of what a control deck is. Well, a control deck in Magic the Gathering is a deck that tries to control 
their opponents. Oh, I knew you were going to do this, you piece of shit. Fuck you. I knew you were going to do that. Tell me more. <laughs> well, control, more than anything, is kind of a shell. Because in EDH, it's harder to make control decks, at least pure control decks, in the classic Magic the Gathering or card game sense work. Because most control decks... Like, I think about Azorius control decks, a variety of them that have appeared in Standard. And a lot of the time, it's just counter spells, hard removal, and then incremental ways to get value, usually instant speed ways to get value. Summoning big creature, like Shark Typhoon in Standard, is a great way that summons big sharks out of nowhere, and that's pretty much how you beat your opponent down. Is you mostly just stop them from doing the big plays that they need to do, deny them resources, <clears throat> and eventually win out by beating them to death, whether with it's with small, big creatures, or just through a vet, very grindy kind of game style. It's slow, most people hate playing against them, and that what's you know that makes them interesting. So uh EDH doesn't really have that because I think one of the things that holds it back are the fact that people I don't know, they just get into this deck building mentality where they go for value, anything else. Where they just <laughs> they just like drawing cards. You know what? I get it. People want to draw a ton of fucking cards. And they want to yeah. make their big creature. It's kind of like EDH is dominated by a lot of value decks and a lot of combo decks. And control doesn't fit in as well as it might. Like there's a couple decks and archetypes that exist. But they're a lot less frequent than things like tribal, combo, value, big ramp decks, all sorts of things like that. Control decks are trying to clear the board, they're trying to deny their opponent from key resources, they're trying to make sure that it's harder for the opponents to go and do their main game plan while still progressing their own. And I think that makes it pretty interesting. So I have a question for you. So like, do you think, you know, in most uh, trading card games, it's 1v1 but do you think the fact that commander is like you're against three opponents typically on average like affects the control strategy maybe i'm getting ahead of myself but i want to oh, ask no, that question and bring that up that's very good because uh it absolutely makes it substantially more difficult in edh because you have to control three players instead of just one like, if you've ever played some standard magic and you played against a mono blue counter spell deck you want to die but eventually <laughs> Sometimes it feels like it's an inevitable thing where they're just going to keep drawing, keep countering your spells, and it feels like you can't do anything. But if you play against a counterspell control deck in EDH, it's not really... It's more about mind games than anything, because they have a very limited number of counter spells. They're only allowed one of. If you're tracking it, you can actually pay attention to, like, there's going to hit a point where it's more likely than not that they don't have counters in their hand and you can just keep going. I've played against counterspell control decks, as well as play it myself. And I think one of the best strategies against counterspell control is just keep playing threats and eventually they'll run out of answers. And whether it's you who kills them or somebody else, they're going to die. <laughs> People hate playing against it and they're going to get focused down. So I think that's another issue with control. It's like you have to try to control people and that puts a big target on your head because people want to do what they want to do. Especially in Commander. Oh yeah. Oh my God. It's the casual format. Do politics play a big part in this because you're trying to get people to kind of play your way as well, making them use the cards that are best best for you at the time that you want to take advantage of them so that, you know, you don't have to waste the resources to either counter it or make sure it doesn't get in the way of your game plan? I mean, yeah, it's tons of mind games. Some strategies more than others. Some are just, you know, upfront, straight to the point, like... The most extreme example of control, I would say, in EDH is stack decks, which are just like, here are all the ways that you can't play magic right now. Try to deal with it. But then there are other things like, you know, counter spells, control decks or counter spell decks that are focused around. A lot of people get the idea of there's no point in me even playing this important card that's key to my game plan because it's just going to be countered. So it leads to this mentality of like, I don't know what to do, so I'm just not going to do anything. So you have to really be able to like gauge what your opponents are thinking if you're playing a control deck. How can you bait people into overextending and punish them without getting too heavily punished yourself? Seems like you know a lot about stacks. We should have you on for an episode about that too. 
You know, maybe one of these days. Yeah. Uh, maybe one of these days. Uh, Stax is... I still think it's kind of fun. But I'm in the minority there. But control decks in general, I just think, are less popular because of a lot of things inherent to the format. Most notably, yeah. It's the fact that three players is a lot harder to control than just one. And it gets overshadowed by value decks and... It's just kind of a blurry line. It's hard to say where the difference between a value deck with a lot of with some control aspects versus a control deck with value aspects. Like where where does that cross? And it's like, you know, I don't have a good answer. I think it really comes down to deck building and how it's executed. But I think still, that said, there's a lot of subcategories of control decks that exist in EDH which make it a little bit more clear as to what is or isn't a control deck. Right. And I think I say this, I think I say this almost every time we bring up an archetype, which is archetypes can be defined, but like they're not like black and white. Like sometimes like two archetypes can kind of blend into each other. They're a little bit of each, not necessarily half and half, but like they do kind of blend into one another. Especially when you're talking about the vague general archetypes like control, combo, and aggro. <laughs> Those are yeah, all these vague concepts. <laughs> yeah. Blankets. Good old comfy blankets. So kind of maybe to backtrack a little bit, like, so we, we were kind of starting this conversation with like counterspell control. And you were saying like, oh, people are afraid to like play their spell into a counterspell because they don't want their count. They don't want their spell to be countered. They're like, oh, well, I'll just wait. And that's like the worst, one of the worst things that you could ever do. Mm -hmm. uh, I've learned that the hard way against you. <laughs> a little bit of context. One of my, uh, one of the decks that I have, is the classic mono blue counterspell control brawl, chief of compliance at the helm, which is mm. all about running a bunch of counterspells. If you want some other good examples of counterspell control, aka the classic draw pass kind of decks that keep all of their mana open, most of it is going to be blue and it's going to feel miserable to play against. You've got brawl, probably is the most prominent example, things like Talrand or even a couple is it decks like Niv Mizzet kind of play styles. And those are decks that are just built around a lot of instant speed interaction, passing the turn, and then at the end of the your opponent's end step, you just go for it. You just say, okay, I'm going to draw a bunch of cards. This is what happens when you leave the mana open. But if you don't leave the mana open, you're going to get countered. And I think this goes into a one of the main plans of a lot of count, or not just counter spell, but control decks. It's you have a very good control shell, and then you throw a combo into it. With the most prominent example probably being Isochron Scepter, Dramatic Reversal, a bunch of mana rocks, you now have infinite mana, do anything you want with it. Draw your entire deck, you've got the classic mono blue win condition of, I drew my entire deck and now I win, whether that be Lab Man or, you know, any of the new Lab Man effects, it can be Jace, it can be Thass as Oracle, all just sorts of stuff that I personally don't think is very interesting. If I'm going to draw out my deck, I want to do something a little bit more fun with that. But that's just me. I think that's a great point you bring up, Park, because like at the end of the day, like you are a control deck and you are working towards something. You are actually working towards your own game plan, which is like probably to combo off. You're not just there to make the other players utterly miserable, like, well, kind of. But like, y y like, y like there's a little bit of misery, but like, oh, all right, now that I've had, I'm going to win the game and we can shuffle up and start another game, right? <laughs> yeah, no. One of the misconceptions, I think, especially with stacks and control in general, it's you're just throwing out resources to stall the game out in this slow, miserable fashion where there is no well-defined win condition. And eventually you just got to hope that you die. <laughs> you die so the <laughs> game can end and you can ask them, hey, can you, can you please change decks? Which is why <laughs> at most I play Baral once a month, because... It's the fun police. That's what people think it is. And that's why I have to be careful because sometimes somebody, like if you sit down with a pod of people you're not super familiar with. Salty. Yeah, salt definitely happens. But if you sit down at a pod and you see something that has the potential to be a strong commander, like if you sit down and you see somebody break out a Zer deck, you're just like, oh. I'm like, okay, I'll play Baral. And then it turns out they're playing an incredibly casual deck that just so happens to have Zer. <laughs> like now. Zer cycling. <laughs> Uh, and you feel like such an asshole because you stop them from playing their relatively casual deck. <laughs> well, you added a ton of mana to your mana pool. I thought you would have a follow-up. There was a time where I think it was uh, 
that black red discard commander. I forget what she is, but I just I only know her from like competitive EDH. Angie Falconrath. Yeah, Angie. The Wolf of the Madness Commander. The Madness Commander, yeah. But I remember I sat down, I was playing Baral. I was against a couple people with who I knew had some slightly stronger deck. And then there's a guy who I didn't know as well who had an Angie deck. And I'm like, okay, this will be perfect for Brawl. Angie, I only know as a combo deck. Turns out he was just playing a pile of cards, some discard synergy. And there were times where he would just cast big spells. I'm like, okay, I'm going to counter that. I'm like, why? He's like, why did you counter that? I'm like, well, you were going to combo off. Why else would you add 20 mana to your mana pool? And it's like, I don't know. I just want to get some value. And it's like, he really was just trying to go for slow value. Oh, no. And I felt <laughs> terrible. Uh. <laughs> so it's one of those things where I always recommend having multiple decks so you don't run to the problem of, oh, I only have a Baral deck, therefore I don't get to play EDH <laughs> because I'm going to feel terrible and nobody wants to play with me. Yeah, drive back home. Or <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the things about control deck is you get that, there's that little association with control that is a no fun valley. All right, so we've been starting this conversation off with like counterspell control, but like there are other ways to build like these grinder decks. Do you want to talk about those as well? Well, you keep mentioning grinder decks, and I feel like that needs to be specified. <laughs> You're baiting me into it. Grinder is a term that I like. It's a term that I use, and I'm not sure how many other people use it. It's a term that I actually stole from Hearthstone, because in Hearthstone, there are a bunch of decks that took the title of grinder decks where their main game plan was to grind their opponents out of resources until you reach fatigue, which is eventually you run out of cards in the deck in Hearthstone and you start taking damage instead of losing the game immediately. And their goal was to just deny their opponents resources. So eventually you won by just having more health and removing all of their threats. There's a grinder mage, there's grinder shaman, and a deck called Dead Man's Hand Warrior, which is all about focus focusing on shuffling copies of its own hand back into the deck so you just kept generating more value as you shuffle in more copies of all of your best control cards. So it's basically control decks without a combo. Their main combo wasn't something that instantly won the game. Their combos were just synergistic effects that would help them get more advantage than their opponent, whether it's denying them resources or just answering threats. So grinder decks are a thing that do exist in EDH, in Magic in general. They're just very uncommon from what I can tell. I think the most prominent example in Magic is probably Lantern Control, which for those of you who don't know, it's an old modern deck from a few years back that was focused on using cards like Lantern of Insight to look at what your opponent was going to top deck into and then using other cards that would mill the top card of their library or sh library in order to deny them top decks and just control what they're drawing. So eventually you can beat them down because they're never going to draw any card. You can make your opponent top deck land or just useless cards because eventually mm -hmm. you're just going to control them to death. And I know a couple people have actually tried to turn grinder decks, specifically lantern control decks, into a thing in EDH. And mm -hmm. that mostly is with uh, Circu, Demir, Lobotomist, and Mishra, Artificer, Prodigy. But those are memes more than anything. They're pretty hard to execute. And obviously, trying to control what four different players top deck is going to be almost impossible. But you know what? Uh, dude, if they, if, they print, if they print a card in the future that allows you to like manipulate all of like your opponent's top of the library, oh, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? <laughs> and there are cards that say, you know, artifacts that are like one mana tap. Each player mills the top card of their library. Ghoul Caller's Bell, I think, mills each opponent's library. No, each Something like that. And that's a card that you definitely run in Lantern Control. But again, it's just one of those things where it's much harder to execute when you're only using one of So other grinder decks besides Lantern Control, I would consider to be like, like Croxa. I recently built a Croxa deck over the pandemic, and one of its main win conditions is indeed a combo, but it's a combo that takes a lot of setup. Croxa being a card all about discarding, and the deck is all about forcing your opponents to discard, running a bunch of the best red control effects, stranglehold kind of things, blood moon. And you're trying to run your opponent out of resources by literally discarding their hands, mm -hmm. denying them tutors, uh, and just destroying all their big threats, using Croxa to really harm them. And then, yeah, sometimes it combos out. 
but the deck is mainly designed to just be able to survive for long stretches of time, run your opponent out of resources, and eventually win through inevitability. I think one of the oldest examples that I can think of is on Offensa, the foremost. There's a three mana, four, four Abzan commander, and her effect buffs creatures when they attack, but the most important thing is whenever a creature is put into the graveyard from anywhere, it's exiled. For opponents, not for you. So there's an old <laughs> on Offensa deck that I remember seeing that I really like, where you run just a ton of hate bears, you run on Offensa, you exile all of your opponent's stuff from their graveyards, and your goal is to run a ton of removal, deny your opponent of resources, and then use Black's mass reanimation spells to just bring all of your creatures back eventually. Where you just get a blanket of hate bears. And with Onofenza, you can buff them up and beat them down. One of the best ways that actually you can do that is with uh, one of the Praetors, the White Praetor. What's her name? Elish Norn. Norn. Yeah, Elish Norn is the best top end because you deny your opponent tokens, small creatures, and you buff your tiny hate bears up into like four fours and like five fours. Big effects, big damage that eventually can beat your opponent down while also controlling them because you're running a bunch of annoying things like Gadok Teague that will deny your opponent any big threats. So grinder decks are all about just grinding your opponent out. It's not about winning through combo, it's just all in on resource denial, hate bears, pseudo stack. Because I think the main difference between that and stacks is most stacked decks are about abusing the uh, unbalance between your stacks effects and your opponent trying to win. It uses a lot of combos, like you look at something like Urza, Mono Blue Urza, that's a, a big artifact combo deck that definitely uses Dramatic Scepter and a lot of artifacts to go infinite. Grinder decks don't care about going infinite, they just care about running your opponents out. And it makes it a really unique kind of play style, but really, really hard to execute. <laughs> But that's why I think makes them an interesting combo, or not combo, control deck. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? I'm laughing at you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So back to control decks. What are some other types of control decks that we were going to get into? Well, something that you're quite familiar with, I'm sure, is mass land destruction. Am I right, guy? <laughs> oh, you caught me. <laughs> We've got two masters in the house. Yeah, I used to play Mass Land Destruction until I... <sighs> it just... I wasn't abusing it as much as I should. So Mass Land Destruction decks are what they sound like. You blow up your opponent's land, and usually you have ways to abuse that. If you don't have ways to abuse that, you're actually just kind of an asshole. Or you're going to come yeah, off of that yeah. and play with you. Again... Playing control decks is kind of hard because you'll lose friends if you do it a little too aggressive. But yeah, MLD, it's all about nuking your opponent's lands out, denying them their most crucial resource of being able to play cards and taking advantage of it. Avacyn, your stuff's indestructible, your opponents aren't. You're just going to come out ahead every time you play, you know, a Armageddon. Am I right, guy? Or if you want to flex on them, you use Ravages of War. And I know you'd love to flex on them because of it. Other uh, examples for commanders are like Rerik Thar, that uses a lot of the red board wipes that blow up creatures, artifacts, and lands, but you use enchantments and planeswalkers to take advantage of that for a bit more of a grindy playstyle. And if you get Rerik back out, he's just going to punish your opponent for playing anything besides creatures. And then Zergo Helm Smasher, who I've seen a lot of people run as a mass land destruction because he's indestructible during your own turn, especially with Zergo and World. World Slayer, which is the equipment yep. that blows up all other permanents, but it's indestructible. <laughs> Zergo's indestructible. Just a horrible, horrible inevitability swings in turn after turn. But yeah, mass land destructions are pretty blunt. It's to the point. It's inherent synergistics between your commander and other mass land destruction effects to get ahead and break that parity. Yeah, I mean, Mike was over here like. We got two masters in the house, but let me just say, I'm no master. I'm just kind of a more like a mediocre mass land destruction player. Uh, Intermediate. Like, <laughs> it, sure. That, that's still being a little generous, considering that I took a giant L when I decided to blow up all my opponent's lands 
And then I just did not focus the one player that I should. And he was able to come back, kill me from no lands. But I think that brings up a good point about not just MLD decks, but control in general is you've got a limited number of answers, especially when it comes to those mass sweeping removal spells. So you have to be very cognizant of when you're going to use them, because if you use a board wipe or a massive nuke like that at the wrong time, you're just you're going to get punished. You're going to regret that. There have been definitely times where, you know, I've cast a damnation or give everything minus X minus X. And the next turn, somebody goes even wider than before. And I'm just like, ah, shit. <laughs> and you absolutely die. If you're the guy that nukes the board, you're going to be placing a big target on your head. That's all about the politics of the EDH. You can just make it even harder to control the, the board. And yeah, it does require a little bit of politicking. It, making sure of like, hey guys, I'm going to help us. Please don't shoot me in the head while I'm a big threat here. I'm yeah. Sure. I've been there. We've both yeah. been there. Yeah. As far as other control archetypes, besides just general running a bunch of counter spells, board wipes, and single target removal, you've got counter spell control, mass land destruction, stack, grinder decks, and I think, even to an extent, I think group hug decks are kind of control decks, just like almost the opposite of a grinder deck. Where grinder decks are trying to run their opponents out of resources, group hug is trying to give their opponent resources, but control how much they're using and they abuse money. yeah aren't you contradicting yourself here park you you're it's <laughs> what's going on here it's almost like it's an exception wow <laughs> you sassy bitch <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a different kind of control it's about making sure you abuse the mind games of giving other people resources so you're becoming less of a threat makes it easier for them to combo off or even just make enemies fight each other while you build up resources to eventually win your It's a different kind of control deck, and I think it oftentimes tends to just turn to the extreme of Kingmaker decks, where they just make one player far more yeah. powerful than the rest and control two players while buffing the So it gets a bit of a bad reputation. I personally don't really like decks because of all of that, but, you know. I guess that's stuff kind of like Feldegriff, Zedru, Kalanos, and Tyro, Braid, like Mono Blue Braids. There's a bunch of mm -hmm. good examples of group hug. A lot of Mono Blue group hug in general, I think. It's kind of like the little finger of decks where you want someone else, you're, you're trying to manipulate someone else to kind of like take the, the target off your back, essentially, right? Yeah, but every time I see a group hug deck, I just look at them and I'm like, I know you're going to try to hide, go under the radar, so I always take them out first. And I never have regretted that once. Uh, I don't think we've explicitly stated it yet, but so I'm just going to. I don't think like newer players should try to make grinder decks. I feel like it's something you probably need to build after you've like really played for like maybe a number of months or years and have a good understanding of not only what you're doing, but what your opponents are doing, because you need to anticipate like their threats and their possible answers to your threats. Yeah, threat assessment is absolutely crucial if you're going to try to play any kind of a control deck. Yeah. Because, <laughs> uh, I don't know, if you've ever sat at a table and somebody uses a premium removal spell on the second biggest threat, while the person with the first biggest threat then goes off the next turn, you'll know that they will probably get flamed a little bit for People, people don't like it when you make mistakes, even though it's all about the game. Yeah, I, I think stacks decks in particular are probably like the most, like one of the most difficult archetypes to play. Like I know all of our listeners, you can fight me in the comments, but I stand by that. I think stacks is probably one of the hardest archetypes I'm to play in Commander successfully. I'm biased as hell, but I would be willing to agree because not only are you denying people resources, you're denying yourself resources, and you're making yourself a target, so you're going to be playing 3v1 most of the time if you're playing stacks. And then control to a lesser extent, but yeah, oftentimes you paint a big target on your back. God knows if you've ever played against a tribal deck, they go wide with all of their big creatures. If you wipe the board, they're going to remember that. Next time they go <laughs> wide, you are going to be a big old target. And then the combo player comes out of nowhere and ends the game. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's important, though. There's there are some very notable weaknesses when it comes to trying to pilot a control deck. Like, with the abundance of value decks, people are going to eventually out-resource you in a lot of decks. <clears throat> you can be playing a like grinder discard deck, but if somebody top decks a windfall or a wheel of fortune, all of the work you did to deny them and and then sometimes if you're against another control deck, you've just got this annoying mashup of both players having answers in their hand and you get to counterspell There's three or four counterspells on the stack because nobody wants the other person. And I've been there. And it's really fun, actually. I'm not even gonna lie, I love the worst. I feel like that's something that I've grown to enjoy more as I play more is more stack based interactions. It just adds a it's 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 nice. Or interaction in general, because yeah, I, <laughs> I feel like when I first started, yeah, it was fun to just play my cards and see what happened. But as I've gotten more experience, it's really nice just being able to <clears throat> interact with your opponent's board. And yeah, you're going to piss somebody off when you destroy their commander for the um. But if their commander is what they need to win the game, you're just playing to your outs. I'm targeting you for the rest of the game now, Park. <laughs> I'm going to be real bitter <laughs> I, about it. <laughs> the number of times I've heard that. <laughs> uh, I know, it's terrible. It's like, no, you're yeah, the you problem. Try, I dealt with you. running an Eldrazi at the helm. It'll make people immediately target you. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Been there, done that. So, Park, my friend, why is it? Why is this strategy so uncommon? Like, I don't hear anyone talk about Grinder Deck Commander. I don't really see that many people talk about... You know, you might see some videos about stacks. You might see some people talk about MLD, but it's often like with a negative connotation. Like, why do you think uh, this strategy is so uncommon in our format? Well, because stopping me from making my plays makes you a objective bad person. <laughs> <laughs> well, like we've talked about, controlling three other players is really hard, and it takes a lot of good decision making. And <clears throat> honestly, thinking is really hard. And that's not a joke. It's really hard to just make the right decisions and learn from mistakes and just eventually refine your strategy so you figure out you have to look through a pile of 99 cards that your opponents have and see what are the most important three or four that you have to deny the battlefield from being cast. Yeah, so can we just take a moment can we just take a moment to acknowledge the fact that like A, deck building for commander is difficult and that B like just playing the game is difficult, knowing all the rules and interactions, knowing what all the cards do in this format. Like, I'll be honest, like I love Commander, but like after playing like one or two games, my mind is just numb. Like I have to think so hard if I'm to play like quote unquote optimally. Like, oh, yeah. And everyone expects you to play like quote unquote optimally, whether you're playing optimally towards a social dimension, a winning perspective like people expect you to play optimally and that's that's almost impossible to ask and i feel like maybe people don't give each other enough of a break you know yeah it's it's tough it takes a lot out of you because you have to focus on four different board states your own and then your opponents and while you're focusing down on somebody who is the biggest threat other people can be building up that you barely even notice, especially right now where I'm playing EDH mostly online, it's kind of hard to pay attention to four people when you can't even like physically look at board states. Right? <laughs> There's a lot that goes into it. And then- Or I, someone's camera is really bad. <laughs> you know, I'm just, Who would have that? <laughs> we'll just spend a half an hour looking at a nice blurry, maybe even calling it a JPEG would be nice. It's more <laughs> artifacted than like screen caps from 2005. Some <laughs> webcam qualities you have to deal with. God damn, man. <laughs> but yeah, you have to really make sure you're playing smart. And it's a bit easier, especially saying this as a combo player, to just focus on yourself and trying to further your own game plan as your main game plan. And then I feel like I, I kind of touched on this earlier, but control cards usually get splashed into a deck, especially because like I hear people talk about like, oh yeah, just throw in a board wipe, throw in your single target the best for your colors so you're throwing in these control cards but that doesn't make your deck a control deck it just means you've got answer it's kind of that old uh the eight by eight theory of deck building where you're supposed to run eight kind of a certain kind of card eight draw spells eight 
pieces, eight like big synergy pieces, etc. So you've got 64 of your main cards, 36 lands, that 100 card deck. And that's a mentality that I've heard touted a lot, especially to new players. And I think a lot of people stick with that. And when you're just running eight ofs, it does make it a little bit harder to pin down the identity of what kind of deck you're playing. It's not like you're playing a pile of cards, but you're playing kind of a generic good stuff-ish deck. And good stuff versus value, it's it's fine lines that are really hard to define. So that makes the definition between like control and good stuff blurry at times. Right. I think I don't want to get off too much on a tangent, but I think this is a good reminder. Like, yeah, it's it's good to watch videos or read articles describing like how to build your EDH deck, like the eight by eight theory, or like you watch a command zone episode and what they recommend for starting to build a deck. But I think it's a good reminder, like that's what you start with. And then you think critically once you've made the deck and be like, all right, now I can tinker with it because that's one of the beauties of this format is like, there's just so much variety. You can do whatever you want. And if you stick to that initial video or article too much, it's actually going to hurt you in the long run. So I don't, that, that's what I have to say. I have no idea what you two are talking about. I put together a deck and it is perfect. No edit. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Sometimes you go literal years changing. And then you go and sit down your LGS. You're playing newfangled hull breacher. And you don't know what the fuck is going on. And that's okay. Because <laughs> you don't need to engage in, oh, I don't know, the arms race of upgrading your decks. We've just, you know... Any strategy you do, make sure it's focused and make sure it's solid enough. But yeah, in general, as an advice, I like to think once you have the concept of deck building down, just go around and look at other people's deck lists they post online. Try to be critical of them. Try to be like, okay, these are good ideas. Okay, what is this doing in your deck? Why are you running just a, almost objectively bad cards? There's got to be a reason. Just try, to, <laughs> try to dig into people's ideas. I like reading primers, whether... I agree with the playstyle, whether it's a playstyle, whether it's combo, control, super aggr aggressive, tribal, anything. It's just fun to see how people think and pick their brains. As somebody who's written a lot of primers, there's a lot you can know about a deck and how to build in that archetype. Go watch our primer episode. <laughs> yeah, go, go watch our primer on primers. Oh god, that was a fun time. This is the primer to the primer of the episode of Primer. Get out. Get out of here. Hey, don't be mad because we're priming you on priming of some primers. Oh my god. Kill me. Getting back on Hey Shadow. Blake. Oh. Prime. Amazon Prime. Anyway. <laughs> but yeah, if we want to go back to talking about the ways to define your decks, it's like there are subtle differences between deck archetypes, there's a difference between an all-out combo deck versus a control and combo or a combo deck with control elements, but that doesn't make it a control deck. If you look at CDH lists, which I know, competitive EDH, bad, but... Oh my god. <laughs> if you look at that, you see a lot of examples of they're running very specific cards for very specific combos, specific lines of play, and then they fill their deck with a lot of really good ways to answer Threats, efficient, very niche answers that fit the format, that fit the niche that they're trying to play against. And that's a fun way to do it. <clears throat> that's why one of the, my favorite ways to do control and grinder decks is through a lot of toolbox decks, where you run a lot of cards, especially when it comes to hate bears, that do very specific things, that hose very specific strategies, some matchups dead, and others almost perfect. They're the one done answer to beating an entire deck sometimes. And you run a lot of tutors, you run ways to replace one card with another, the old survival of the fittest effect, and then you make, you get rid of something that's not going to be useful here and replace it with something that's almost perfect. And toolbox decks, you know, your classic uh, birthing pod decks, like that I think is super fun. It's an interesting play style and it isn't used as much as I think it should be in EDH because when you break out that perfect answer, that makes you feel smart, that rewards your deck building choice and it can screw over one player without getting you targeted by the other two at the same time. 
So there are definitely ways you can abuse control and use everything at your advantage better than your opponents might. That's what makes it fun. Deck building is fun. Yeah. Thank you, guy. <laughs> I'm definitely feeling the alcohol. Oh, we all are, and that's the whole point. <laughs> I'm flush. Why does this always happen? <laughs> it's almost like a, we, we encourage each other to just keep on drinking. Because we live a life of regret. Fill up that glass, you dirty apes. <laughs> You're not drunk enough. I still hear sobriety in your... Damn it. But yeah, now we can go on to talk about like the actual weaknesses. Yeah, yeah, Park. So what are some weaknesses to control decks? Well, <laughs> what a natural and clean transition. <laughs> uh, I mean, All I done by some sober people. Oh, absolutely. This is going mwah, swimmingly. But I think we've kind of touched on it. Controlling other opponents is hard. And oftentimes they can just out-resource you. You're trying to deny them. You're trying to answer their threats, but they're being more proactive. And it's really hard to match proactivity when you yourself aren't going to be able to keep up. Which is why you need to make sure your focused game plan is able to deal with the win condition of your opponents and then keep answering their threats helps you get further along. That's why I do like looking at Brawl as the example of like, what is a good control deck? Brawl digs you deeper. It digs you to your combos because you're whenever you counter spell, you're going to basically discard a card, draw a card, which will help you get further along to your combos. My own personal way to play Brawl is to have one of the Eldrazi Titans that you can discard, shuffle your graveyard back into your deck. So if you ever just... And then you run a couple of cards that uh, delve and exile cards from your graveyard. So you're exiling some of the weaker things like lands that you don't have graveyard. Every time you, you want to just draw more cards and then eventually you hit that Titan, you discard your Titan, you shuffle it back in your deck and you've got essentially infinite resources find your deck to being that perfect balance of counter spells and draw cards and eventually you can win through whatever means you want i use a combo but you can also just overwhelm them with a bunch of zombie to it's pretty cool it's a lot of creativity there but other weaknesses come from just yeah you've got a limited number of answers and if you use them at the wrong point you're going to die there's also i've seen a lot of people talking about aggro lately it's a pretty decent aggro or burn cards in EDH lately. Yeah, we've been getting a lot of really good burn cards for Commander as of like the last year or so, I'd say. Yeah. I mean, Guy, I know you and I are loving it. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. I'm, I'm very excited for the future of burn. Oh my god, Terror of the Peaks is an absolute godsend. <laughs> the number of times I can just bring it out and then immediately... It's incredible. <laughs> It's a beautiful time, but combo decks can sometimes just wipe control out. Aggro decks try to burn control. It's that classic rock, paper, scissors that you see in other forms. Combo beats control, control beats aggro, aggro beats combo. But aggressive decks, you gotta have your answers and it's harder to have answers in a one of four. Combo decks, you can deny your opponent a bunch of resources. Hold on to the one resource they need and you can't answer it properly. They're going to combo off. I've definitely gotten my resources denied while playing a colorless artifact combo deck, but the fact is I could hold on to the one tutor that I needed, bring out my main win condition, and still go infinite. There's a really tough challenge that comes to building combo decks and comes from making sure you're building the deck right. Like combo deck, or control decks I mean, they take a ton of testing to get right, because if you mess up your ratios, you're going to end up burning yourself and your opponents will eventually just be able to beat you down because your win condition isn't as good as theirs. It's it's a it's a tough little thing to do. It's a little bit of a doozy. And that's what makes it interesting. So I have a question for you, Park. Like, yeah? to what end do you think becoming the arch enemy happens a grinder deck or a control deck? Because, you know, if you're playing the strategy correctly, you're starting to like strip away all of your opponents' resources whether that's in the hand, on the board state, in the graveyard, whatever it be, or maybe a variety of those three. And they've, like, eventually your teammate, like, your op <clears throat> opponents realize what you're doing, and they're like, oh, crap, we gotta now team up against Park and his Brawl deck. Otherwise, we're all just gonna lose. Like, how much of that is, like, a weakness where, like, three opponents, on average, like, start focusing you? Yeah, that happens. <laughs> that happens in, uh, 
Sometimes it ain't shit you can do about it. If you're playing something like Urza or Brawl and they just keep removing commander, sometimes you're just out of luck. If you're playing like Marin of Clan Neltoth and they're just denying you any of your commander value, the ability to revive your creatures, they're denying Marin staying on the battlefield and getting a bunch of tokens so you can revive everything, it's just gonna make things really tough. And yeah, that requires building around the idea of I need to make sure that my plays, my control effects are going to be as powerful as I can make them in order to survive being <laughs> the arch enemy. Which, yeah, that kind of is all about the mentality of EDH and the old arms race debacle. It's a lot. It's not easy. It's not easy to play arch enemy. And uh, I'm used to it because I like to make my decks efficient. <laughs> And that oftentimes means pissing people off, but it also doesn't help that I play combos. And combos are probably more hated sometimes than control. It's hard to say. Yeah, I will say, Park, uh, I think you're just kind of the player who like doesn't hesitate at all. You're like, hey, I'm going to sit down at this table and I'm going to try to win. If you interact with me, I'm going to try and fight through it and win anyways. Fuck you. And <laughs> what do you think of that idea? Well, first off, I'm honored by that statement, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's some decks like my Omnath Locus of Rage deck. I literally have designed. It basically has no interaction outside of Omnath himself being able to burn down things with lightning bolts or enter the battlefield to deal damage when my creatures come to play it's like i don't have ways to deal with artifacts or enchantments but i've just got such a refined play style for, in a sense it's kind of an aggressive combo burn deck because edh doesn't have very well defined archetypes and it's just about doing my game plan as efficiently as possible and it's a deck that doesn't need protection for its commander because eventually I'm going to keep ramping stuff out that even if you kill my commander 10 times, I can cast him for 27 mana. I have cast him for 21. So it's just about good deck building. Whether you're playing combo, aggro, kind of mismatch, it's about how well can you play your deck? How well is your deck focused on reaching that win condition? And yeah, it ain't easy. It's never easy being cheesy. <laughs> being the being the target it's kind of fun actually i i like building my decks strong and i've got a reputation at least at my local shop i'll see if i still have it after i go go back when COVID's over because god knows it's been a year since i played paper magic with people and maybe they've forgotten that i'm a try hard but building a reputation for being the player that has cutthroat decks just makes it so your games are going to be more interesting. People are going to know that, hey, we can't let this person just snowball out of control. So you have to be ready to make sure that people are going to answer your threats. How are you going to deal with that? And that's pretty neat. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I, I want to play in paper someday when all this global craziness is over. Maybe one day we can play in paper magic again. <laughs> I know, my dreams are unreasonable. All right, so to kind of tie, tie us all back together... Can we all talk about like some common like control commanders in like this format? Just to like we've kind of sprinkled some throughout this episode, right? But can we like address some more directly? Like guy, you can address like Avacyn Park. You can address Rurikthar. Can we talk about those? Guy, hey, what's up? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've talked about my Avacyn deck probably every episode for the most part. And I mean, the idea is just, you know, you want to slow down the game because you're playing mono white and I mean, mono white has a lot of its issues, but I mean, the one biggest issue is that your opponents make more resources than you. So you're trying to slow them down so you can get to the point where you then just blow everything up. Then you can go in and hit your opponents with Avacyn and either just kill them through combat that way or, you know, get that good old commander damage in. Mm, commander damage, you say? So would you... It's like a Voltron think... strategy. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> Do you think that Voltron strategies are kind of like control strategies then? 
I hate you both. <laughs> this is a topic that I want to talk about, but not here in this episode. So, what Blink's trying to imply is he's not really a fan of calling all Voltron control decks. I'll Ooh. fight you. Get out of here. Uh, do you actually want my opinions on it real quick? Do you actually want me to go on a mini rant? Of course I want you to go on a mini rant. It really Blink. sounds like you're trying to bait us into like saying you're holding yeah, it back. So We know you want to rant about Voltron. You live for it. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about this really quick, okay? I don't want to distract from the topic here. All right, so Voltron is a strategy where you try and deal 21 or more commander damage to your opponents, and they die. That's the rules of the commander format. And uh -huh. in trying to push and in trying to push that archetype to the utmost limits where you win as fast as possible, you actually can't go any faster than a combat reliance strategy can. So you, instead of trying to, like, aggro them out as fast as possible, you have to slow them down with stacks pieces and whatnot. This is like the exception to like everything I say in like the Voltron episode that we do. Go listen to that first. There's always exceptions to everything. That's what I'll say about that. <laughs> so yeah, for the most part, I don't think Voltron is exactly a control strategy. Yeah, no. It just runs control elements. You splash in the control to make it so your game plan stays more focused. So then what are some of the more common control commanders that you would typically see? Uh, think about like anything that uses the colors Esper, Grixis, Bant, or Azorius. If it's got white and blue, it's almost guaranteed to have a control to it. Like, I've played mm, against Amon Tau deck. Yeah, Amon Tau uh, is one that I've played against a few times. Their entire game plan is to steal all of your stuff and blink a lot of their steal effects or removal effects. You've got send triplets, which are literally taking things from your hand and resources. Any of the nickel boluses, especially uh, Bolus the Ravager, is all about making you discard and getting to their big... It's kind of a value deck, but like Grand Arbiter, Gustin, and Lavinia, uh, Zorius Ray in the Gade, those are pretty much as controlling as you can get. <laughs> Yeah, it's like Control 101. <laughs> yeah. Then you've got stuff like Urza, High Lord Artificer, Talran, Sky Summoner, just making creatures through your effects or drawing through your removal effects. Uh, then there's stuff like uh, Campbell, Console of Allocation, Zedri, a little bit less traditional control decks, but Marin, Clan of Neltoth, Hepatra, Vizier of Poisons, all about one minus one minus one. Synergy encounters to remove creatures, Tassiger and Damia, Sage of Stone. Those are great ways to maintain card advantage while using removal effects. Rune of the Hidden Rel, Noralm, easy removal, bouncing. Derevi, I mean Derevi stacks, Derevi control, that's as hate as you can get. Yeah, man. It's like, I think it's one of the highestly scored salt card uh, cards on edhrec.com. Like, it may change in the coming years, but I know that people get super salty around Yeah, it's it's a classic. And other things, like, less common stuff you see, like maybe Angus McKenzie or Mathis Fiendseek. Even stuff like Queen Marchessa with a bunch of hate bears. And those are the kind of things that I think of when I see control. Or when I hear people talking about control decks. And then all sorts of commanders have the potential to be control decks. Rurik Thar, the Unbowed, and trying to get them out and, you know, abusing Rurik Thar's effect, but he can be played as a control. Destruction or stacks effect deck. You know, Onofenza is kind of an aggressive plus one plus one counter synergy deck, but I like it as a hate bear. Croxa, it's a, a grinder deck through and through. Uh, Chainer Dimension Master, one of my classic combo pace somebody exiles all of my combo pieces, still can survive. It's got, like, control decks have a lot of potential and they have flexibility. And then, Guy, I know you love your Avacyn as a bit of control. You woo woo. You woo woo indeed. So what you're saying is, Park, that I need to join the club and make my own grinder. Fucking finally. God, how long does it take you to realize it? <laughs> the whole point of this episode was more like an intervention to, one, <laughs> get Blake to drink more, and then get him to build a grinder deck. You're <laughs> damn right. This kid is way too sober way too often. But it doesn't even need to be, you know, grinder deck. It just be any kind of control deck you want. 
Because all you fucking play is Voltron. Change it up, man. Maybe. I'll think about it. <laughs> I mean, your, uh, your Boros deck is starting to get more control-ish, combo-ish. Yeah. Maybe. Throwing in, I mean, you fill that shit with hate bears. Come on. Yeah. Why do I still have Leon and Arbiter in there? I don't know. Once we get a new pretty angel, like maybe the new Sigarda that'll come out in Innistrad will be more of a controlly kind of card. Or maybe it'll be terrible like the other one. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe either or. or. Hey, Blake, maybe it'll give protection to humans. You never know. <sighs> No. <laughs> Do something relevant in this format. No, please. Hey, if one thing's true, Wizards loves just focusing almost entirely on EDH to the point where it makes, you know, cancerous three drops in blue and black that deny you from the game, but are important and good for the format. And we're not going to get into that topic. We've reached the end of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, folks. Uh, we are the Wizard Staff Podcast. You can on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Make sure to leave a like and review. It actually does help us out a whole lot. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Wizard Staff 101. You can send us an email at thewizardstaff101 at gmail.com if you want to bitch and complain about how fucking stupid we are. Thank you all so much for listening. We've had a great time. Peace out. Like, Peace. comment, and subscribe. Oh, get out of here. Oh, my God. <laughs>